This is Chapter 3, Cells of Living Units, Part 1, The Plasma Membrane and Transport. To begin with, let's discuss briefly cell theory. Cell theory basically states that the cell is a basic structural and functional unit of life. All organismal activity depends on the individual and collective activity of the cells. So what occurs in your body when we discuss anatomy and physiology is really dependent upon what occurs on the cellular level. When we look at <coughs> what the cells do, the biochemical activities of the cell, you can think about this being the physiology of the cell, are dictated by the subcellular structure or the anatomy of the cell. So we will be looking both at the subcellular structures and the physiology of the cells. And a key thing to the cell theory is that the continuity of life is a cellular basis. What this, mean is, what this means is that all life arises from pre-existing cells. So in terms of humans, we have uh, human adults produce sperm and eggs. Those sperm and eggs are living cells. The sperm and egg comes together. And those fuse to create new cells, which then results in a new organism. Right? So that is the continuity of life. Now, if looking at different kinds of cells, there are many different kinds of cells. Here we have erythrocytes. These are red blood cells. When you see cyte at the end of a word, C-Y-T-E, that has to do with cells. And erythro has to do with red. So these are red blood cells. We'll see here these are called fibroblast, epithelial cells. These are all types of connective tissue that we will look at in Chapter 4. In chapter 9, we'll talk about skeletal muscle and smooth muscle, and you can see examples of those kinds of cells. In chapters 11, 12, and 13, we'll talk about nerve cells. Some other cells that we will see would be things like fat cells, macrophages, which are involved in the immune system, and sperm. Now, please notice these cells are not drawn to scale. Okay? Sperm are not actually three times as big as red blood cells. What's key here to notice is that there's a huge diversity in cells in terms of their shape, their structure, and their organization, which makes it difficult to talk about the basics of cells. So what we will do in terms of learning the cells, we're going to start off looking at a generalized cell. So this cell here represents a basic type of cell, which has all of the working parts of the cell, and we will talk now about the relationships between those parts and what each of those parts do. We're going to begin talking about the plasma membrane. Right? And the plasma membrane is this area that surrounds the outside of the cell. If you think back to those necessary life functions, one of the necessary life functions was maintaining boundaries. The plasma membrane is what is going to maintain boundaries on the cellular level. What we have here is this is going to separate what we call intracellular fluids from extracellular fluids. Intracellular meaning within the cell and extracellular meaning outside of the cell. This is not a static or a set thing. Here we have a dynamic role. Right? So the plasma membrane is going to have a changing function and that function is going to be important in how the cell behaves, the cellular activity. If we take a look at a section of plasma membrane, so what we see here is if you imagine the cell like an orange and you've peeled off a section of that orange rind, that's basically what we're looking at here. Right? In this portion inside is where you would have your intracellular fluid. This would be your cytoplasm or your watery environment. This would be your extracellular space, <clears throat> which is also a watery environment. Now the best model of a cell membrane is called the fluid mosaic model. And this fluid mosaic model is a bilayer or a double layer consisting of phospholipids, cholesterol, and glycolipids. Now hopefully the phospholipids, cholesterol, and glycolipids sound familiar from what we looked at in chapter two, our basic and organic chemistry. If we focus in on the phospholipid bilayer, here we have these representatives of phospholipids. Please remember that phospholipids are a type of lipid or fat. They are unique in that they have a hydrophilic or water-loving head. So this region here is that phosphate group where we have inherent charge. That charge then is attracted to water. Here we have two fatty acid chains. Those fatty acid chains are the hydrophobic or water-hating tail. What occurs 
each of these molecules has a part that likes being near water and a part that doesn't like being near water. So we see these stacking up so that this entire central region here is going to be hydrophobic and this outer and outer region will be hydrophilic. So this is the hydrophilic heads lined up towards the extracellular space and here towards the intracellular space. You will also notice this molecule here. This is a cholesterol. Cholesterol, which you've all heard of before in terms of things like diet and nutrition, cholesterol is actually an important component of plasma membranes. In addition to the phospholipids and cholesterol, we also see some larger molecules. Okay. One would be glycolipids. Here we have a carbohydrate group that has a lipid bound. Glyco, whenever you see glyco, think of carbohydrate. Right? So here is an example of a glycolipid. This is the tail, the fatty acid tails, that is the lipid component. And instead of having a phosphate group, what we have instead is a carbohydrate. The carbohydrate is represented by these small hexagons. Okay. This would be an example of a polysaccharide or a carbohydrate. We also have glycoproteins. Right. This is where we have a carbohydrate group bound to a protein. These purple blobs that we see throughout this model are all proteins. Together, what we see is that these carbohydrates are sticking up from the top of the cell, creating a layer that we call the glycocalyx. This is basically what we might think of as a sugar covering, and what this allows is for cells to be able to recognize one another. These uh, carbohydrates of different cells are going to be unique markers. The other important component that we need to talk about are these purple blobs. And these purple blobs represent proteins. We have integral proteins. Okay? These are firmly implanted within the bilayer. Right? These are usually transmembrane, meaning they cross the length of the membrane. We also have these peripheral proteins. These peripheral proteins are associated with the integral proteins. They may be intra or extracellular. These may function in support or they may be enzymatic. We're going to look in depth at these proteins because in this dynamic structure of the plasma membrane, it's really the proteins that are doing the majority of the work. So let's take a look at some of the different protein membrane, um, sorry, pro membrane protein draw jobs. Okay. One of these is transport. When we look at transport, we'll see that certain things need to pass through the plasma membrane. There are different ways this can occur. We may have what's called passive transport, where objects, chemicals, of course, may pass through a protein, so they may enter or exit a cell. We also will see active transport, and we're going to look at these two in depth. Okay? In active transport, we utilize energy in the form of ATP, and that will actively be transporting molecules across the membrane. Some membrane, membrane proteins will act as enzymes. Enzymes are biological catalysts. So these are proteins that are going to help change something in terms of undergoing a chemical reaction without being changed themselves. Membrane proteins are also important in what's called signal transduction. Signal transduction occurs where you have the binding of a chemical to a transmembrane protein, and that transmembrane protein then undergoes some sort of change in shape, which will kick off a bunch of chemical reactions that will occur within the cell. This will be very important in the endocrine system in terms of looking at how hormones function in relation to their hormone receptors. Something that we will talk about in depth today <clears throat> is intercellular joining. This is how two cells may be connected, and this often occurs due to interactions between proteins. Cells may also recognize one another using proteins as well as that glycocalyx. Right? Here we have proteins and carbohydrates, and here we have another protein that is recognizing that. So that is allowing for cell-to-cell -cell recognition. 
Membrane proteins may also allow for there to be attachment to the cytoskeleton. Right? The cytoskeleton, you can think of as the skeleton of the cell. So this is the internal structure that gives the cell its shape. Right? And then also the extracellular matrix, or ECM. The extracellular matrix is outside of the cell, and that helps to support the cells in their external environment. And we'll see that will be extremely important in things like connective tissues. What we will focus on right now is talking about how different cells may be connected. Okay? So this would be intercellular joining. These are also considered membrane junctions. We'll look at three types of membrane junctions, the first of which is the tight junction. In the tight junction, we have an impermeable junction that's going to encircle the cell. This would be the plasma membrane of one cell. This is the plasma membrane of another cell. Each cell has within it transmembrane proteins that lock together with the plasma membrane proteins of the other cell, creating a very tight space. You can imagine this looking like cellular Velcro. When these cells are held together then, we do not see molecules able to easily pass through and between this. What this creates is creates a nice boundary layer. When we look at epithelial tissues in chapter 4, epithelial tissues will be tissues that help to form linings. When we have a lining of things of, say, the stomach, we want those cells held tightly together, okay? and those would be the tight junctions. Another type of cell-to-cell -cell connection that we might see is what's called a desmosome. Here we see rather than having a tight connection, we do have a decent amount of space. This is called intercellular space or space between cells. Here we have a reinforcing, so this is a strong connection. We have proteins that cross and link together. They are said to interdigitate, which means they zip up like a zipper. They have behind them a plaque, which is a thickening of the plasma membrane, and then they connect to what are called intermediate filaments, which are also proteins within the cell, part of the cytoskeleton. This creates a very strong connection between two cells, so this is important in cells that are under constant stress, right, where they're being pulled and pushed. This allows them to stay connected. Another kind of connection, this is more of a functional connection, this is called a gap junction. The gap junctions occur where we have regions of plasma membrane in one and another cell. Each of these has a half channel called a hemichannel. These channels lock together and allow messages from cell A to pass quickly to cell B. This allows for extremely rapid cell-to-cell -cell communication. You will see this being very important in the heart and how the heart very quickly sends signals to allow for a coordinated contraction. Now the next thing that we will look at in terms of the plasma membrane is how materials can cross the plasma membrane. The plasma membrane is said to be selectively permeable, so only certain, certain things, chemicals, should be able to pass. So we will look at a few different ways in which things can pass. The first manner in which chemicals may pass is what's called simple diffusion. Simple diffusion is where you have movement from areas of high to low concentration, so that's called a, along a concentration gradient. If you imagine a ball rolling downhill, you're going from high to low concentration. Simple diffusion occurs directly through the phospholipid bilayer. This really needs to have um, very small nonpolar and lipid soluble substances which can pass through. More common is what's called facilitated diffusion, and in facilitated diffusion what you have is you have these proteins becoming important. You may have a protein channel. A channel is always open. It is less selective. It is usually for very small lipid insoluble solutes. You can think of this as a door. When the 
molecules pass through, they usually move from areas of higher to lower concentration, like a ball rolling downhill. Another type of facilitated diffusion is with a carrier protein, and this is for larger lipid insoluble solutes. And here, because we have a larger area, we must have a, a, a way to limit what passes through. So what happens with a carrier protein is the molecule does move from areas of high to low concentration. As it enters, it causes this protein to change shape. When the protein changes shape, it then moves out. There's no energy put in here, though. The change of the shape that occurs in this protein is simply due to the passing through of this molecule. Okay. And so that's considered a carrier protein. These are being carried through. Now, there are special proteins to allow for the diffusion of water. And water diffuses, diffuses slightly different in the way we have to think about that. And that is to do with the fact that all of the intra and extracellular fluid is really water-based in nature. Okay. So in order to understand how water diffuses across a simple uh, semi-permeable membrane, we really have to think about the stuff that's not water. So these proteins here, these channels, these are called aquaporins, and aquaporins allow for the movement of water from higher to lower concentration of water. But because water is everything surrounding, we actually have to look at the opposite. So we have to look at what's called osmolarity. Right? Osmolarity is a measure of the total concentration of solute particles in the solution. Okay. So rather than measuring the amount of water, we measure the amount of solutes. And we don't have to be too specific as to what the solutes are. The solutes, for the most part, in biological systems are going to be ions. Right? We looked at those in Chapter 2. We also have to think about what's called tonicity, and this will be very important in terms of how solutions affect cell volume. In terms of tonicity, when we have something that is isotonic, we have a solution that has the same solute concentration as that of the cytosol, or the liquid portion of the cytoplasm. Isotonic solutions, for those of you that are especially interested in the nursing profession, isotonic solutions, this would be an example of normal saline. Normal saline is an isotonic solution. That's why if someone is given an IV, they are not given pure water, they are given saline. Now hypertonic, these are solutions that have a greater solute concentration than that of the cytosol. So a hypertonic solution would be a high salt concentration solution. Okay. Hypotonic would be a solution that has less solute concentration than that of the solute. Right? So if you were to imagine normal saline, which is about 0.09% sodium chloride solution, a hypertonic solution would be if we had much higher amounts of sodium chloride in it, so let's say 9% sodium chloride, Okay, that would be about a very strong salt water. And hypotonic would be very, very low sodium chloride concentration, so that would be normal water, tap water, pure water. Okay. The way these would affect the cell would be as such. Right? In an isotonic solution, the solution that surrounds the cell has the same solute concentration. So water exits and enters the cell with no net movement. What that means is about how much moves in is about the same as how much moves out. So this cell is what we would see in an isotonic solution, no net movement of the water. In a hypertonic solution, imagine this cell placed in a hypertonic solution. What would happen is the water that was in, inside the cell would want to move out more effectively and more rapidly than water would want to move in. The reason for that is you can imagine that the water is moving to try and create an equilibrium across the plasma membrane. As it's doing so, it's trying to dilute that hypertonic solution to equal what's in the cytosol. Okay. What would occur when we have lots of water moving out of this cell is the cell would actually shrink in on itself, and that is called crenation. In a hypotonic solution, if we put a red blood cell into pure water, that water would attempt 
to dilute the inside of the cell so we'd have more water rushing into the cell than out of the cell and eventually that cell would swell and swell and swell until it burst which is called lysis. Okay. So these are the three different possibilities of how varying tonicity would affect red blood cells. Now the next type of transport is active transport. The reason we need to look at active transport, this is going to be extremely important, especially when we talk about membrane potentials um, in chapters 9 and 11. Active transport implies that we are actively using energy to force solutes across the membrane. We definitely need to have carrier proteins here. And the energy source is going to be ATP. ATP we looked at in chapter 2, and ATP is adenosine triphosphate. It is an energy source when the triphosphate, when the third phosphate group is broken off, creating ADP and inorganic phosphate. That energy can then change the shape of molecules. The reason we need energy here, we're acting against a concentration gradient. So we are going to be moving solutes from areas of low concentration to high concentration. So now we're actually pushing a ball uphill. So you can imagine if you're trying to push a ball uphill, you have to put energy into it to make that occur. Now in terms of primary active transport, this is where we have the direct hydrolysis of ATP that's going to cause the transport protein to change shape. Hydrolysis is the breaking of ATP into ADP, adenosine diphosphate, and inorganic phosphate. The key example we will talk about is called the sodium potassium pump or sodium potassium ATPase. This is going to pump sodium out of the cell and pump potassium into the cell against their concentration gradients, leading to an increase and a maintenance of concentration gradients. And this is going to be extremely important in how we see the functioning of the muscle cells and neurons in chapters 9 and 11. So in taking a look at this, this gives the overview. So let's start at the beginning. Right? Imagine we have a cell. This cell has some number of what are called passive or leaky channels for sodium and potassium. We have higher concentration of potassium inside of the cell than outside of the cell. So potassium wants to move along its concentration gradient and wants to move out of the cell. There's more sodium outside of the cell than inside of the cell, so sodium naturally wants to flow in. So this is depicting where we would see our concentration gradients. So what we are going to attempt to do with this sodium potassium pump is work against these arrows. We're going to take sodium and pump it out of the cell. We're going to take potassium and force it into the cell. Now this will occur with a transmembrane protein. Okay. Here we have this embedded transmembrane protein. This is the plasma membrane. Right? There will be specificity here. So what we will see happen, this has three seats or three places where sodium ions will bond in, okay? or will actually will fit in. At this point, we have a low energy state. This protein then takes ATP and the hydrolysis of ATP into ADP and inorganic phosphate leads to what's called phosphorylation. The phosphorylation is then going to change the shape of the protein. It's going to move it to what's called a high energy state. So you can see that here it's open towards the inside. When we take that P, that phosphate group, it's going to move, it's going to flip and actually pump the sodium out. It has changed now its orientation. In doing so, it forces the sodium out and it has now opened up two spaces for potassium. Now the potassium molecules will move in. At that point, dephosphorylation occurs, so the release of this phosphate group into the inorganic phosphate. Then we have the protein returning to a low energy state. When this occurs, the phosphate, I'm sorry, the potassium, the K plus potassium, will then move into the cell and the cycle repeat itself. 
So this is the sodium potassium pump. What we see is we see this pumping of sodium out and potassium in. And over time what that does, that creates and maintains this concentration gradient where we have more sodium outside of the cell than inside of the cell and more potassium inside of the cell than outside of the cell. And it works against these arrows. That is primary active transport. Now we also have something called secondary active transport. And what secondary active transport is, is when we use a primary active transport system to create a concentration gradient. And then that concentration gradient is used to move something against its own concentration gradient. So it's a two-step. It's like a hitchhiker or a backpack, a backpacker. Okay. Um, so we actually can use an exchange pump so we can stick with our sodium potassium pump example and we're going to look at how that drives the transport of other solutes. Right. Here we have what are called coupled systems and these coupled systems may be considered symport or antiport. In symport we have two substances that are moved across the membrane in the same direction and in antiport we have two substances that are moved in opposite directions. So the best way really to understand that is to look at an example. And our example here, okay, this is the sodium glucose symport transporter. Right? So here is our sodium potassium pump. We've seen this before. This sodium potassium pump is actively pumping sodium out and actively pushing potassium in. This leads to a concentration gradient of sodium. So now we have more sodium outside of the cell than inside of the cell. So sodium is looking for an excuse or looking for a way to move into the cell again. The sodium glucose transport, or the symport transporter, wants to move glucose into the cell against its concentration gradient. So it wants to take this glucose and force it in. Now instead of directly using ATP, as the sodium potassium pump does, what this sodium glucose symport transporter does is it uses the sodium that wants to move in to allow glucose to piggyback on the sodium and be forced in. So sodium is moving with its concentration gradient in the way that it wants to go and as it goes along its concentration gradient it's dragging with it this glucose into the cell and it's allowing this glucose to be forced into the cell against its concentration gradient. Now these diffusion, facilitated diffusion, secondary active transport, primary active transport, these only function for things that are relatively small, small enough that they can pass through a protein. However, there are many substances that are either created by cells or needed by cells that are too large to pass through a transmembrane protein. So there we have to look at vesicular transport. Vesicular transport is a transport of large particles and macromolecules across the plasma membrane. There are two ways this can occur. We have exocytosis. Exocytosis is exiting the cell. Okay? When we have the movement exiting the cell, usually this is stuff that has been produced by the cell that is going to leave the interior and be released into the extracellular space. We also can have endocytosis, which is movement towards the inside of the cell, and this allows for large particles and macromolecules to be brought into the cell. Exocytosis is actually fairly complex. Right? We're going to give an overview of exocytosis. In exocytosis, if we have a substance that has been created by the cell and needs to be released or secreted, that substance usually is going to be located within what's called a secretory vesicle. Right? These vesicles we'll see are part of an endomembrane system, usually coming off of the Golgi apparatus, which we'll see later in the chapter, and these have the same basic construction as the plasma membrane. What these vesicles are, are basically little in-pocketings of plasma membrane that can be full of a substance produced by the cell that needs to be released. Exocytosis occurs when this vesicle is able to dock due to certain special proteins that link up and allow for docking to occur. That docking or those docking proteins, usually called snare proteins, are able to wrap together and actually open the plasma membrane, open the secretory vesicle, allow those to fuse and this substance to be released from the cell. 
that is exocytosis. Endocytosis is basically the opposite effect then. Here we have something called clathrin mediated endocytosis. And what this is, is we have certain areas of the plasma membrane that are destined to become vesicles. Right? These have on them a marker protein called clathrin. There's usually a slight indent, right? so this is called a clathrin coated pit. So when this substance needs to be ingested, it would make its way into this pit and kind of get trapped. That would lead to an invagination or a folding in of this region of the plasma membrane. Eventually that would pitch, pinch off, okay? and when that pinches off, it creates a clathrin coated vesicle. That vesicle can now move through the cell. It may move to something called an endosome, okay? and an endosome is within the cell. If this is something that needs to be used or utilized within the cell, that may occur. When this occurs, any of these extra proteins don't just go to waste. They may get recycled and put back into the plasma membrane. Sometimes the substance that is being brought in needs to be broken down. And if it needs to be broken down, it's going to be taken to something called a lysosome. Lysosomes, you can imagine, are kind of like the stomach of a cell. There are digestive enzymes, and digestive enzymes can then break down the substance. In other cases, when we see this endocytosis, endocytosis is really the beginning of a passing the substance across, and that's called transcytosis. So here we have endocytosis, transcytosis crossing, and then finally exocytosis, in which we have the substance being released, as we previously saw endo and exocytosis occurring. So this transcytosis occurs, especially when we have areas where the cells form a tight boundary in things like epithelial tissue, but where we need to move substances across them. Okay. We also have vesicular trafficking, and in this case you're moving, um, moving substances from one area within a cell to another. A final kind right, is called phagocytosis, also pronounced phagocytosis. And here what we have is we have a way of bringing in very large solids into the cell's interior. Okay. What occurs here are we have these projections that are called pseudopods or false feet that are actually reaching out and enveloping something. We see this most clearly in humans in what are called our macrophages. These are a type of immune cell that can actually eat bacteria. This phago or phagi, okay, um, also pronounced phagi depending on, on where you're hearing it, this means eating. Right? So phagocytosis or macrophagy or macrophage, these are cell eating, cell eating. So you can imagine what the cell is doing is the cell is going to take in this bacteria, bring it to a lysosome, and then break it down. In some cases, the actual process of endocytosis only occurs in the presence of other chemicals. Right? In that case, we only see the invagination and the creation of these clathrin um, protein uh, channels or pits occurring when a receptor binds. So we call this receptor mediated endocytosis. This endocytosis only occurs in the process, uh, sorry, in the presence of certain receptors.